terrific turnout. Thanks very much. Can you hear me up the back? Excellent. Okay, my name's Bryce McKenzie, and I'm one of the founders of Groundswell New Zealand. And uh, I'd just like to welcome you here tonight. Uh, I can assure you, you'll uh, have an enjoyable time. This is our uh, fifth meeting, and uh, we're starting to learn what we're supposed to say now. So <laughs> we might go on all night, in fact. <laughs> okay, so it's coming up two years ago since uh, Laurie Patterson and I uh, got really concerned about the overreach of government and uh, decided we would call on people to get some tractors going and have a bit of a protest. Now, we weren't sure how many would turn up, but as it turned out, that very first protest in Gore, there was over 100 tractors at it, and it's good to see some of the people that took part in that here tonight. Thanks for coming. They were uh, really good supporters. Oh, I've lost my place. Uh, Groundswell is a, a group of um, volunteers. None of us are on a payroll at all, and um, we just make ends meet the best we can. We rely on you people to actually support us uh, with donations. Uh, we try and stay apolitical, and I keep telling Joseph Mooney that. They're an apolitical organisation. But, but we still think that uh, it's really important that people have their say. Uh, and when it comes to democracy, and we're prepared to stand up and make that stand uh, for people. Um, also, I want to put a wee plug in tonight for what's on Invis. Uh, they're good supporters of ours, and we would suggest you support them. Uh, you can go to their social media page, uh, what's on Invis, and give them a like. Uh, the same thing applies to Groundswell NZ. If you like what we're doing, just go to our Facebook page and give us a like. And please join up at our website. Uh, we, we enjoy emailing people about what's going on. And uh, this is growing quite markedly, so we like to keep in contact with everybody we can. Uh, the other thing is that we do sell merchandise. Groundswell hats and uh, other bits and pieces, and you can find them at uh, www.groundswellnz.co.nz so if you want to buy some uh, apparel. Okay, so tonight um, Logan is going to be chairing the meeting. Uh, Logan's done a wonderful job. He's had a committee. We've had a group of people from all over New Zealand that have been part of putting this together. We've even had one or two meetings in the North Island. So um, there's a whole group of people behind this and I'd just like to thank Logan for what he's done. It's not easy when you come to organise these events and we had to pluck Logan out of the back paddock. So he's a little bit precious. So I just ask that you actually uh, treat him kindly tonight. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Bryce. Um, that was a great introduction, and, and Bryce is turning into quite the salesman himself. Um, you're going pretty good there, Bryce. Can everyone hear that all right? Sounds like I'm really quiet. But, um, right, it's a good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, on behalf of Groundswell NZ, the New Zealand Taxpayers Union, and Refreshing Local Democracy, I'd like to welcome you all here tonight. Um, we, hope our, we hope you find our presentation tonight to be informative, enlightening, and hopefully we might even have a little bit of fun along the way. Um, now I know it's a weird concept, especially in New Zealand at this time, to have three groups working collectively towards a common goal. Um, and that is, that is for us to stop the theft of ratpayers' assets and put the power back within our communities. Now this doesn't mean we agree on everything, and that's okay. We, we, can, we can do our jobs separately, but we're coming together for this common goal. Um, like I look at Jordan Williams um, from the Taxpayers Union, he's got, he's got these pointy crocodile shoes. Um, they probably go about six inches past his big toe. And I think, what the hell are you doing, mate? Like, that, there's no point having that. Um, he looks at my gumboots and he wonders what, what I'm up to. Um, but for me, they're fit for purpose, they do the job, and um, they've got me out of a lot of sticky situations. Um, so me and my family, we're sheep and beef farmers. Um, we're, we're at Mandeville, just 20 k's west of Gore. 
Um, we see ourselves as food producers, um, food producers for the country and, and food producers for the world, and we're damn proud to say that that's what we are. Do we have any other food producers in the, in the room here this evening? That's awesome to see who this. Now, there seems to be a common rhetoric, a, a, a well-constructed narrative coming through in our media here in New Zealand um, that, that the food producers of this country are, are ruining our environment and somehow we seem to be doing more than our share to contribute to climate change. Now, if we as a nation are willing to accept this, that's fine. But we need to understand that if we do, food prices are going to increase, food avail availability will decrease, and somewhere in the world, hopefully not in your home, people will go hungry. Now I strongly disagree with this narrative from our current government. And I say to the food producers in this room and all across New Zealand, you hold your head up and you be proud. You be proud that we are the best, we are the most efficient food producers in the world. Don't you let anyone tell you otherwise. That wasn't meant to happen. <laughs> I should have read it twice at home. Do we have anyone else in the room here tonight who holds down a job, pays their taxes, pays their rates and generally contributes to their community? That's good to see. Um, now, is there anyone here tonight who enjoys eating food? It's great to see that we can all come together and agree on something. Now, now my reason for asking that was, was because when we strip everything back to basics, food, water and shelter is, is what we need to survive. If we haven't got these, we're in big trouble. Now, to create that food, we need, we need good soil and we need water. So, so when government brings out policy and, and, with, and legislation, that, uh, that means someone has the right to control that water, that scares the shit out of me. So the, this leads us into the focus of tonight's meetings. Tonight's meeting. Um, we plan to use three waters as the catalyst to highlight the loss of local democracy we feel we're currently experiencing in New Zealand. Our groundswell stance on this has been from the start that no ratepayers' assets should change hands without our communities having the opportunity to vote via binding referendum. We also see these meetings as a very important opportunity for our communities to come together, show their, or share their concerns, show their frustrations and, and have their opinion heard. But we thought, how do we do that? We weren't expecting a crowd quite this big, but how do we do that when we've got two or 300 people in a room? So we came up with the idea of a democracy card. Now, as I just said, we weren't expecting this many people, so you haven't all got one, but um, those of you that have, you'll see on your seat you had a piece of paper, an A4 sheet, and on one side it had bang on. So if somebody's speaking to you and you agree with them, we'd love it if you hold up that bang on and let them know that you agree. But on the other side, you've got bullshit. Now we've all played this game at home with our family and if somebody, you know how it goes, if somebody stands up and they try to spin a yarn and you don't agree with them, you call bullshit. Now this is your, this is your, your opinion. It's your right to have your opinion. So please use it liberally. And um, yeah, there's no wrong or right answer. If that's your opinion, you, you voice it. And um, you guys down the back, if you haven't got one, just yell it out. We've had, we've had quite a bit of that going on. Now the order of proceedings for the evening, uh, we're going to have Peter Williams. Um, he's a very well-known ex-broadcaster. Um, we've got, we've got, then we've got a bit of a chance for any councillors that are present to speak. Um, then we've got Nobby Clark, the ICC Deputy Mayor. Most of you guys will know him. Um, he's going to be speaking via a pre-recorded video. Uh, then Chris Romero. This is Chris's hometown. Um, so yeah, he's been warning up all week for this one and um, yeah, he's slowly getting better. He's going to speak on behalf of refreshing local democracy. 
Um, now we have clipboard circulating. Um, I think we do. We should have. The ladies down the back are on that. Um, I'm going to explain these now, ladies, so you can uh, get it out there. Um, there are two clipboards circulating with letters to our councils on them. Um, we need to get them moving now. We usually explain the situation and then um, let you sign it then. But if you don't, yeah, if you don't under understand it and you don't want to sign it at this stage, yeah, feel free not to and just do it at the end as you leave. But um, so what we're going to do is uh, write these letters to council, and then uh, next. Thursday, 1 p.m., we're going to deliver these to the ICC and then we'll walk around to the South and District Council. Now they read, we the undersigned, the people of the Invercargill City, request the Invercargill City Council elected representatives to vote during a public meeting on our request for our council to hold a binding referenda on the issue of Three Waters. Now there is, we realise you're not all from the Invercargill City, so there's also South and District Council ones. Make sure you get the right ones. And we've got another one that reads, We the undersigned, the people of the Invercargill City, request the Invercargill City Council elected representatives to vote during a public meeting on our request for our council to discontinue any further funding of our GNZ, effective immediately. Yeah. That, that's great that a few of you understand what that, that's about. And, um, yeah, oh, we think we've... We think we've got the wording correct, and we think there is no way they can just chuck this in the bin. Um, so hopefully that is the case. You ready, Pete? Righto. Um, that's enough for me at this stage. We'll move on to Peter Williams. Um, as I said, he's a very well-known ex-broadcaster, and I don't think he needs any more in introduction than that. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Peter Williams. Cheers, Logan, and thank you very much. Great to be back in Invercargill again. I lived here as a kid, went to Newfield School, Lithgow Intermediate, which doesn't exist anymore. What is it called? Ascot Community. And then Ascot Community School came back here to work at the radio station. What was it? 47 years ago in 1975-76. Uh, great to see uh, Invercargill having this uh, flash new commercial development. I hope it goes well for you. Interestingly enough, uh, I'm staying at the Quest Hotel tonight, or Quest Apartments. When I was a kid, that was the post office. So it's uh, great to see uh, the town is finding use for its uh, famous old buildings. Anyway, tonight I am here representing the Taxpayers' Union. Uh, the Taxpayers' Union is an organisation dedicated to monitoring government spending and highlighting government waste. And frankly, with this government, it is like shooting fish in a barrel. <laughs> I'm not a member of any political party. I may once have been in the media. I am no longer, and I probably never will be again, based on three things. My age, my race, and my gender. <laughs> <laughs> and the fact that in my last job as a radio talkback host, I was not afraid to criticise and question the government on various issues, not just on the one in front of us tonight, but on other fronts as well. The government... The government in this country is now the single biggest advertiser in the commercial media in New Zealand through the Ministry of Health. It's also making direct cash contributions to large commercial media organisations like the New Zealand Herald, Stuff and Media Works. So you know that you have a serious, serious issue in this country when you have a media which is literally bought and paid for. And don't let anybody tell you any different. The so-called so public interest journalism fund is a classic case in point. Now, for media to access this nice little slush fund of $55 million, it must, and I quote, actively promote the principles of partnership, participation, and active protection under Te Tiriti o Waitangi, acknowledging Māori as a Te Tiriti partner, unquote. Now, from where I come from, journalism is not actively promoting anything. Journalism is about offering all sides of a story, examining the facts around the issues and leaving the reader or the viewer or the listener to make up her or his mind on an issue. So when you have the media 
dipping into this big fund, and the Herald and Stuff in particular have taken sizable chunks of cash from it. In the case of the New Zealand Herald, it's in excess of $2 million. Then there is no chance that the salient facts about water and water infrastructure and the plans for it will be discussed openly and honestly in our media. And that is the struggle that we as citizens in New Zealand face. As this government, which unfortunately for now can do what it pleases because of its parliamentary majority, is about to take from local authorities the infrastructure for reticulating your drinking and washing water, the infrastructure for flushing it all away, as well as the pipes and drains that ensure that your place mostly does not flood during a major rainstorm. So those are what this government has called the three waters, tap water, waste water, and storm water. And at the moment, it's the responsibility of your local council, the Invercargill City Council, the Southland District Council, to build, maintain, and expand the water infrastructure inside the boundaries of the local authority. Now, let's face it, some councils do this better than others. Invercargill City Council, by the sounds of things, is right near the top of the list for having invested over the years. But we know that some councils don't do it very well at all. The most infamous example of that, the 2016 incident in Hastings, when the Havelock North system became infected with lurgies and it made some people sick. Although, according to the official inquiry, the problems in the water may have contributed to the deaths of just three people. And has there been any widespread waterborne disease outbreak anywhere in New Zealand since that incident of 2016? The answer is, of course, no. So what's the overall standard of drinking water in this country? If somebody says to you, what's the quality of drinking water in your town? You'll say, generally... It's pretty good. But there is this continuing issue with old sewerage pipes in various places around the country, in Wellington, uh, for example, and the fact that they sadly burst way too often. I know from the experience of living in Auckland not that long ago, the stormwater system in the suburbs close to the city is hopelessly out of date and incapable of coping in a heavy storm. Therefore, there's a major project underway in Auckland called the Central Interceptor. It will hopefully keep the sewage out of the stormwater system when the project is finished at some stage in the next decade or so. Now, mention of the central interceptor has been noticeably absent during discussion of three waters. That's because Auckland's water agency, Watercare, is well aware that there is a problem with the ageing pipes, so it's spending something like $1.2 billion to build this 15-kilometre long sewage tunnel underground, downhill, from Grey Lynn under Auckland Central through to Mungary and the sewage ponds there. The point is that Auckland's water care knows full well that there is a problem and it's doing its best to fix it. Water care did not need a regional water entity formed by Wellington politicians and bureaucrats to tell them that a major piece of sewage infrastructure had to be built. They did it themselves. Some other councils are well aware that there is some serious work needed in various places around the country, but not everywhere. However, this government seems to think that all politicians, that all problems rather, can be solved in this country if they, and only they, run the show. Hence the desire for centralisation. And we've seen it with the polytechs. Some of them, like the one here, the one in Dunedin, worked just fine. We're seeing it in health. Yes, there needs to be some rationalisation of the unwieldy DHB system, but a completely new centralised entity as well as a Māori health authority doesn't seem either rational or fair to the majority of the population. And according to this government, the only way to solve the issues regarding water infrastructure and the investments needed to upgrade and expand it is to centralise. Therefore... The water pipes and the treatment plants developed and owned by 67 local authorities and their predecessors for well over 100 years will be taken off those councils and put in the hands of these new water entities. And around the country there will be four of them. The government disingenuously, of course, says they will still be owned by the councils who paid for them in the first place. And they'll give councils shares in the new entities to prove that ownership. 
But believe me, that is a complete ruse. It's a fallacy. When you really own something, you can decide how it operates. You can improve it. You can make money from it. You can be in charge of it. That's what we all thought that ownership of an asset means. But now we've got to the stage where the mayors of three local authorities, Nigel Bowen in Timaru, Dan Gordon at Waimakariri, and Cheryl Mai in Whangarei, have been in the High Court this week to ask the High Court to declare what asset ownership really means. The case was heard Tuesday and Wednesday this week in Wellington. I reckon it's a very, very important court case. The question the applicants want answered is this. What are the rights of asset ownership? Could there be a more basic question than that? At the moment, the government's plan to govern and manage these four water entities will take away completely the rights of your councils to make any decisions at all about either the operations or the future investment of water infrastructure in your local area. So here's how the government has structured the operation and the governance of these four water entities. Now, for a start, the water entity boundaries are based on iwi boundaries. Down here, we'll be part of water entity D. It covers almost all of the South Island, except for Nelson and Marlborough. But you might ask, why is the South Island not one entity in its own right? Could it possibly be that Naitahu, as the dominant iwi in the South Island, are not particularly influential in the nelson Marlborough area? I would say quite probably. So the four water entities are set up, and even though the government has told us the local authorities will have ownership of the infrastructure, they will have no real say on how water services are delivered in their local area. So who'll be making the decisions? Well, here's how these water entities will be run. For a start, each entity will have a regional representation group. There'll be 12 people at each of these groups. Six of the 12 will be appointed, presumably by central government, from the local councils. In this area, your council uh, will be one of about 20 local authorities merged into Entity D. The councils will have six of the 12 people on the regional representation group, and there is no guarantee that somebody from Invercargill or Southland will be one of those six. The other six members of the RRG will be iwi representatives, presumably in this country, uh, in this part of the country rather, appointed by Naitahu. Then, in a crazily convoluted setup, the regional representation group will appoint an independent selection panel, which will in turn appoint the board of directors at each of these water entities. Are you confused? I think you're supposed to be. And in a last minute sop to local concerns, the minister in charge of all this, Nanaya Mahuta, says we will now have sub-regional advisory panels to the regional representation group, which is, of course, yet another layer of bureaucracy. But the kicker is that these sub-regional advisory panels will also be a mix of local council and iwi appointments, in other words, yet more co-governance. So, just that you can have no doubt about what the most important qualifications are for membership of the board of directors for each of these water entities, the cabinet, following Nanaya Mahuta's lead, has decreed that the board must have, and I quote from the Department of Internal Affairs website, the board must have, quote, general collective competence in understanding the principles of the treaty and Mataranga Māori, Tikanga Māori and Te Ao Māori, and include members with specific expertise of Mataranga Māori, Tikanga Māori, Kaitiakitanga and Te Ao Māori with respect to the delivery of water services. Now, I don't know about you, but it seems that knowledge of Māori myths and the Maori worldview seems to be a far more important qualification for membership of these boards of directors than knowledge of, say, engineering or finance. Because, you see, if we do need to spend billions of dollars upgrading our water infrastructure across the country, wouldn't engineering and financial skills be the most important disciplines that a prospective governor of those assets should have? Of course. 
And not only will iwi have six out of 12 members on each of these regional representation groups, any decisions the groups make, such as who will make, the, make up the appointment panel to select the board of directors, any decisions those RRGs make must pass with a 75% majority. So it's very obvious then that the iwi interests will be at the forefront of any decisions about each of these three waters entities. The claim by the local government minister that local authorities will continue to own the water infrastructure is, in my opinion, nothing more than a fallacy. And let's see if the High Court agrees this week. So if local authority representatives can have no majority on the decisions of the regional representation groups, then they can have no control over who selects the board and therefore who will govern the entity. In other words, their rights as owners have been completely taken away. To quote Gary Judd QC in a recent article, the Three Waters proposal has been deliberately designed to give iwi and Māori the predominating governance influence. Bear in mind that getting a return from an asset is a right attributable to an owner. Therefore, the proposal would confer on iwi and Māori, but no one else, a direct attribute of ownership. Now let's get back to basics here. Fresh water is a natural substance. It falls from the sky, it collects. In our rivers and lakes, it is life. Life without water is impossible. And that's for everybody. Water is not exclusive to anybody. It's not exclusive to any ethnicity, any religion, or any gender. Water is for all. Nobody can own water. John Key, remember, said exactly that. And who can argue with him? British common law, which New Zealand adopted after the Treaty of Waitangi, said naturally flowing fresh water is not owned by anyone, but is treated as a public good. And that's still the legal position in New Zealand today. It's logical, and you would think easy to understand. It's a position which should have been confirmed by the courts in this country. Instead, our learned friends in the judiciary have put water ownership through the complicator way too often. And it's led to this ridiculous situation regarding Lake Taupo. The most recent deed of settlement between Ngāti Tūwhāritoa and the Crown said the iwi owned the lake bed, the subsoil under the lake bed, and the space occupied by the water, but not the water itself. In fact, the deed says the water remains in public ownership. But because the water occupies space above the lake bed, Tūwhāritoa now have the capability to charge commercial users of that water like launch operators and charter fishing companies. Not for the use of the water, mind you, but for the use of the space occupied by the water. Go figure. So because, because our best legal minds have not confirmed something as straightforward as public ownership <laughs> of all fresh water as the British law lords did hundreds of years ago, we have a situation open to all sorts of interpretation, which has ultimately led us to this quite extraordinary attempt to confiscate, without meaningful reparation, billions of dollars in water reticulation and disposal assets built up and paid for over more than a century, for reasons which, on the surface, I believe are quite spurious. For instance, there are claims that up to 38,000 people are affected by waterborne disease each year. Do you know anybody? That figure is a fiction. It's the upper end of an estimate from the Ministry of Health about the number of water-caused gastro infections each year. The actual evidence says we have about 17 waterborne GI outbreaks each year, affecting on average about 145 people. That's 2,400 people each year, not 38,000. There is no evidence whatsoever to say that between 34 and 38,000 New Zealanders get sick from water each year. It's complete and utter fiction, yet it seems to be one of the most quoted figures by Labour politicians when they push the case for three waters reform. Now we should also refer to the Heipuapua report. The report commissioned by the government, of course, to outline a way in which New Zealand can meet the 
non-binding obligations of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. The Heipuapua Report, uh, which you may know, suggests some as yet undefined form of co-governance for New Zealand by the 200th anniversary of the signing of the treaty, which is now less than 20 years away, uh, says this. Rangatiratanga Māori will not detract from the Crown's duties to respect and protect the human rights of all individuals. It's a model inspired by an understanding of equity that means all peoples and individuals should be able to realise their potential. That's fair enough. But that this might only be possible if different approaches are taken for different peoples and individuals. It does not mean that all individuals must be treated the same. Unquote. Think about that. A paper to government, which has not been dismissed, remember, and many aspects of which are already being instigated, says that not all individuals in this country must be treated the same. You know, this is a free, civilised and liberal democracy. The key to our society is that we are all equal before the law. And the law must be such that all people during their lifetimes are presented with equality of opportunity. And hey pua pua. Hey pua pua seems determined to break with that concept. In fact, hey pua pua means a break. Think about some lines from other politicians, various politicians in recent times. Uh, my old television weather colleague, Tamati Coffee, when introducing the failed Rotorua local body representation bill, he talked about the bill being a tweak to democracy. Willie Jackson, the Maori Development Minister, says democracy will no longer be the tyranny of the majority. Even the Deputy Prime Minister, Grant Robertson, says the nature of democracy has changed. And then the former New Zealand First MP and a big wheel in Waikato Tainui, Tuku Morgan, you might remember him from 25 years ago of the $70 underpants saga. The other, day, the other day, he echoed what many a Maori leader is saying. Democracy, he says, doesn't work for Maori. He's got to be kidding, doesn't he? Democracy, as Sir Winston Churchill famously said, is the worst form of government, except for all the other systems that have been tried from time to time. Let me tell you how well democracy has worked for Māori. There are 120 MPs in the New Zealand Parliament. If those identifying as Māori comprise somewhere between 15 and 17 per cent of the population, a truly representative New Zealand Parliament should have between 18 and 20 Māori MPs. Since the 2002 election, in other words for the last 20 years, there's never been less than 19 Māori MPs. In the current Parliament there are 25, in the previous Parliament there were 29. Māori have been overrepresented in Parliament, proportional to the population, for two decades. Tuku Morgan, Willie Jackson, Rawiri Waititi, that is how well democracy works for Māori. It produces an overrepresentation of Māori in the House of Parliament. And do non-Māori care? I tell you what, I'm Pākehā, I don't care about that. I'm a New Zealander. Otago and Southland are my Turunga Waiwai. It's my place in the world, my home. My ancestors arrived in Dunedin in 1848. I'm a New Zealander. This is the only land that I know. But I want everybody who lives in this country to have the same rights and privileges and equality of opportunity. That's what a lively, thriving, free and liberal democracy should be. So no matter if your ancestors arrived here in the 13th, the 19th, or indeed the 21st century, this young nation is for all of us, or it should be. But we have a group among us, aided and abetted by senior political leaders, who want to change that. They want democracy, in the words of Tamati Kofi, to be tweaked, maybe to be replaced by rangatiratanga. But then you might ask, what is rangatiratanga? What is a rangatira? Is it not a chief? So is rangatiratanga not chiefly authority? How democratic are the processes involved in rangatiratanga? I would suggest not very. But then specifically on the matter of water, 
Hey, Pua Pua states, increased Māori rangatiratanga will require considerable resourcing and capacity building. If Māori are to exercise governance power, there needs to be support for this and it may take time. Tikanga Māori will evolve and develop to greater application in the modern world, but will also require support. The Crown's main contribution to capacity building will be in resourcing. There are multiple streams from which financial contributions might be sourced, including, for example, levies on resource use, where Māori have a clear interest, if not a strong claim to ownership, such as water. Unquote. Could that be any clearer? The Heipuapua report suggests in the kindest and most gentle way that the Crown should resource Māori and iwi capacity building towards so-called self-determination by putting a levy on water use because Māori have a strong claim to ownership of water. Now the concept of Māori ownership of water must be challenged and challenged strenuously. Water is, as we all know, a naturally occurring phenomenon. It was falling from the skies for millions of years before the arrival of the first peoples in this land. And again, to quote John Key, nobody owns the water. It still falls from the skies in various forms of precipitation to the tune of 600 billion cubic metres every year in this country. Our biggest challenge should actually be to capture and reticulate that wonderful natural resource all over New Zealand for the benefit of us all, not for one particular ethnicity. That learned judges in this nation's courts could even contemplate a concept such as ownership of fresh water is beyond me. I can sort of understand that land under lakes and rivers can be managed by private and often iwi interests, but the concept of actual water ownership is just illogical after all. How can a litre of water in Lake Wanaka today be owned by anyone when that same litre is passing by Belclutha tomorrow and is in the Pacific Ocean half an hour later? See what I mean? Water is like the air that we breathe. It's never settled in one place. Therefore, how can it be owned? But you can see from that Heipua Pua report what the end game of the so-called Three Waters Project is. Look, I know that there is a need to improve water services in this country. Many local authorities have water infrastructure needs requiring significant investment. That is not disputed. But as Simon Watts, the National Party local government spokesman, said in Parliament today when this bill was uh, introduced and had its first reading, he said, this is about pipes in the ground. It has nothing to do with iwi, iwi rights and the Treaty of Waitangi. But there are many other local authorities who are doing just fine, as we've noted. In Bicargo is one of them because of their consistent and significant investment through the years. And over time, they've accumulated extremely valuable assets. In Tauranga City, for instance, where I used to pay rates, the book value of the water assets, according to the 2019 annual report, $941 million. It's probably higher now. The government is offering Tauranga City $48 million to take over the $941 million asset. Does that sound like a good deal to you? It's a great deal for the government, isn't it? A billion dollars worth of pipes and treatment plants for less than $50 million. It's the deal of the century. And once they have the asset, of course, the new water entity can then levy the poor ratepayers of Tauranga even more than the $2.52 per thousand litres they currently charge you for water use there. You had very short showers in Tauranga, believe me. And despite what the government and the local government minister says about water levies uh, being used to pay for badly needed upgrades to water infrastructure around the country, remember the Heipuapua report makes it very clear that some of your uh, new water levy will be going to Maori and iwi interests so the Crown can make a contribution to, quote, the capacity building of Māori rangatiratanga. The Heipuapua report suggests water levies will be used to resource an as yet undefined form of Māori self-determination and no one in government, especially Nanaia Mahuta, has outright rejected the concept of water royalties for iwi. Now where I live, and where many of you live I guess, we don't pay 
a separate water rate. Each rates bill breaks down where the money is going. At the moment, in my annual rates bill for our house in Wanaka, around $800 each year goes to Queenstown Lake District Council, Queenstown Lakes District Council, uh, for water services. But what will happen if and when Queenstown Lakes is sucked into the vortex of water entity D? What will happen is that ratepayers in Queenstown Lakes will be having water meters installed at their homes, and they'll be paying by the cubic meter for the abundance of local water reticulated to their homes from the local lakes and rivers. And if we start paying a separate water rate or water charge to water entity D, will there be a matching reduction in our annual rates bill from the Queenstown Lakes District Council? In my case, will my local rates bill reduce by $800 per year? I think I just saw a pig flying across the sky. <laughs> What's more, some of that money, every time we turn on the tap or flush the dunny, some of that money will be going, according to the Heipuapua report, to fund Māori self-determination. Is that fair? Is that logical? Why do iwi and Māori deserve a cut of every litre of water that you and I use? If this proposal is allowed to go ahead or is forced through by the Minister against the wishes of the people, iwi will control the water assets of this nation, and that must not be allowed to happen. Water is for everyone. Water cannot possibly be claimed as a taonga. Article 2 of the treaty, yes, agrees to protect the chiefs, sub-tribes and all the people of New Zealand in the unqualified chieftainship of their lands, villages and all their treasures. <coughs> but surely it's a step too far to suggest that water, that naturally occurring gift for all of us, without which life cannot exist, surely it's a step too far to suggest that water be regarded as a treasure, as a taonga. In my logical, linear mind to suggest otherwise is just patently absurd. The land I live in, I want to be one where we have equality of opportunity, freedom of movement, freedom of expression. We have a proud history of continuous liberal democracy, dating back to the first New Zealand elections of 1853, becoming the first country in the world to offer universal and equal adult suffrage 40 years after that. That unbroken run of equality for all in this country is under threat by various government initiatives. But with the exceedingly valuable water assets of the nation under threat of government confiscation, surely now is the time to act, to protest loudly to your current local council and to vote in this year's local body elections only for candidates who oppose Three Waters reforms. You must say... You must say loud and clear that you do not want your pipes and sewerage system owned by government-appointed entities with the ability to take even more of your hard-earned money than is the case right now. The Taxpayers' Union is backing and funding a group called the Water Users Group in their action against the government to challenge Three Waters. The crux of the matter is that Nanaya Mahuta says she has advice from Crown Law that co-governance of her Three Waters entities is required by the Treaty of Waitangi. But just where is that Crown Law advice? And what exactly did it say? The advice Miss Mahuta says she's relying on has never been made public. So did Crown Law actually say it? Or is the minister just making things up? And that's what the Water Users Group case is about. The claimant wants the courts to examine the minister's reasons for instigating Three Waters, and if the courts agree that the minister got the law wrong, to say so. Now, that can't stop the government proceeding, because if it has the numbers, and it has, it can change the law. But if the claimant is correct everyone will know that the government is basing its actions, basing its legislation for Three Waters, on a legal falsehood. And what government would do that a year out from an election? Probably this one. <laughs> not surprisingly, 
Not surprisingly, mainstream media have uh, not reported extensively on this challenge, but the Taxpayers' Union has been supported by thousands and thousands of New Zealanders in this case. If you have donated to fight this cause, we thank you. If you'd like to consider supporting the cause now, you can go to taxpayers.org.nz and follow the links. This is a hugely important time for the future of New Zealand. If Three Waters happens this year because of the Labour Party majority, a majority, by the way, brought about by that thing that Willie Jackson doesn't seem to like called democracy, then it must be rescinded by any National Party-led government. Thankfully, the National Party's new boss, Christopher Luxon, finally issued a statement last week saying a new national-led government would repeal and replace the Three Waters legislation. Their likely partners in a coalition government, the ACT Party, David Seymour, is also saying on Facebook and in other media, uh, Jacinda might steal, we will repeal. So it's very obvious that if there is a national and ACT-led government from late 2023, this legislation will be repealed. Look, there does need to be some aggregation and improvement of water services in some parts of the country. I'm the first to admit that. And it's going to cost many hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. But it must be done in a far more efficient and in a far more targeted way and not through four central government imposed water entities. To have assets worth billions and billions of dollars seized by central government in the name of the Treaty of Waitangi is just a step too far for this New Zealander and I would hope for you too. <laughs> to, to, paraphrase, to paraphrase the Prime Minister, let's stop this. Thank you. <laughs> Peter. Now, uh, wasn't that refreshing to um, hear someone in New Zealand just call it elders? Um, just with your democracy cards, um, just be aware that if you're down the back and you're seeing a whole heap of bullshits, um, <coughs> that from, yeah, from the front here we are seeing bang on, so yeah. Just in case you guys down the back were getting confused. Um, now, we've all heard of the term bring back Buck, but um, I reckon we should start our bring back Pete. <laughs> um, so, as, as Pete alluded to, um, our, our current media in, in New Zealand do get $50 million of funding. It's not a bribe, it's, it's a fund. Um, and if you feel that you may not be hearing the, um, you know, a, a balanced view from from that media, um, there are there are other um, are, there are other other sites that you can uh, hear news from. Um, has anyone in the room heard of the platform? Those guys are good. So if you want to hear a more balanced view, try them. And um, we've just met Mike from uh, What's On and Inders. Didn't know who he was last week, but now we do. Um, so yeah, check that out as well. Right, we'll now move on to um, if there's any councillors present that would um, like to speak. Now, we've been contacted uh, by Ian Pottinger earlier. So is Ian here? Yep. yep. Would you like... Well, yeah. Ian can come up here. Yep. No. So, uh, Ian, you're from the ICC? Yep. Right, look, um, practice, I practiced my speech this afternoon in front of my dog, Bear, and I got one bang on and two bullshits, so <laughs> hopefully I can do better with you guys. And, uh, yeah, thanks, Pete. That's um, a great introduction. Yeah, as, as announced, my name is Ian Pottinger. I'm a city councillor and also chair of infrastructure. Now, I'm going to speak on three waters, but I'm going to share some of the information and thoughts from my role on council, so probably from a different viewpoint. I'm going to talk about six things, uh, history and key events, 
behind Three Waters, uh, Council's involvement in the process, ICC's feedback letter to Nanaia Mahuta, ICC's request to join the Three Waters pushback group, uh, debt and privatisation, and a wee look at the future. Now, Peter touched on the Havelock North incident, and to me, uh, a very important uh, event in the Three Waters. And the reason I'm saying this is that every speech that I've heard from the Prime Minister and the Minister say, if we don't do Three Waters, people will die. Now, this is the same fear-ridden rhetoric that they used for vaccine passports. Just the same. Just the same. Fear. Okay. Like the bang ons. Yeah. Next step in the Three Waters history line, and a lot of you won't know this, is that in August 2017, Infrastructure New Zealand releases a report called Building National Infrastructure Capability Lessons from Scotland. This followed an earlier March visit to Edinburgh, Glasgow and London by 33 delegates from New Zealand's public and private infrastructure section. I don't know who paid for it. Then in July 2018 at the local government conference in Christchurch, a senior Scottish water official did a presentation on Scottish water reform. Now I was there at the time, and this seemed completely out of context. What's a Scot doing over here talking about three waters? And it wasn't Glen Livet. The alarm bells started to be started to ring then. So 2021, for council, three waters became very real. All the councils had to respond to RFIs, that's requests for information from the DIA. We had to provide substantial, substantial detailed figures around each of our council three waters, financials and capabilities. Now the government then used this information and responded back to each council with individualised three water modelling and asked for all councils to provide feedback, that's 67 councils, by the 1st of October 2021. Now ICC did write a feedback letter which I'll now talk about. The letter dated 28 September 2021 addressed to the Honourable Nanaya Mahuta. It was presented to Council at the infrastructure meeting on the 28th September and uh, I'm going to tell you what was contained in the letter and in the report. So the report started off and it was quite clear this was the time when everyone was under the belief we could opt in and opt out of Three Waters. So the report states quite clearly that this council will not make any decision on opting in or opting out without first consulting with the public. Okay, so that was the start of the report. And now the letter. This was prepared by senior staff and it's very unambiguous and delivers its message. So, some key points on the feedback letter. Right, firstly, this is from the letter. The government's financial modelling for Invercargill is substantially flawed. The financial assumptions are wrong and grossly exaggerated. Next, the government's proposed entity model and how it will operate does not align with international accounting standards. Now, you'd think they'd get that right. This means that you cannot have one organisation owning the asset while a separate other organisation has control over them including the ability to raise debt. Next thing we mentioned, Council's own financial modelling using correct assumptions shows ICC could deliver far greater three water affordability to its ratepayers than the new model. Right, next, next comment was about the claimed 45% efficiency of the Scottish model. Now I'll explain 45% efficiency. So they're saying that where a council would spend $100, they can do the same work for $45. The, yeah. That's what 45% efficiency, efficiency means. Yeah, yeah, okay, that's, yeah, yeah, some bullshit there. Right, the reason this 45% can't be achieved is because of the vast difference in geogra 
geographical scale and population density between entity D, which will have been explained, being four times the size of the Scottish mainland. So that's, yeah. And, and another side note for efficiency, how can this new model create 9,600 new jobs? These are not jobs for contractors laying pipes. This is new bureaucratic jobs being created. So ask the question, yeah. Anyway, the proposed governance model, we touched on this, would exclude the Invercargill ratepayer, any say over its water assets. Peter touched on that. And we would be penalised for our long-term investment in our three waters. Our debt on three waters is only $16.3 million. The letter also speaks strongly on ownership. It says under Section 130 of the Local Gov Government Act, we cannot legally relinquish ownership of assets and we would not willingly do so under any report. That's the staff saying that. That's well done. Right, so imagine the minister sitting down on a Sunday receiving 67 letters and the vast majority of them being exactly the same as Invercargill said. They had two options. The government had two choices. Bail on the current proposal or make it compulsory. Guess what happened? They made it compulsory. So, Three Waters, Three Waters Pushback Group. Now, on December 7, at the infrastructure meeting, uh, ICC was asked to decide on whether it would join the Three Waters Pushback Group, which was a group of councils who wanted to explore uh, more agreeable alternatives to that of the government. Now, council was this council was asked to sign a memorandum of understanding and to provide financial assistance of $15,000 to the, to the course. The resulting motion to join the pushback group was unfortunately defeated 9-6. Right, um, those, those who voted in favour of joining the pushback group were myself, Councillor Skelt, Councillor Clark, Councillor Lewis, Councillor Arnold, and Councillor Kett. Just can you vote, can you? Make, sh make sure you remember that, guys. That bit of information there is going to become very important at the end of this meeting. Oh, OK, right. The ones who voted in favour of joining were myself, Councillor Skelt, Councillor Clark, Cl Councillor Lewis, Councillor Arnold and Councillor Ke Kett. That adds up to six. Yeah, it does. Yep. Right, now on to debt. Debt. ICC can borrow up to 2.8 times that of its revenue. We're told the new entities will need to borrow up to eight times their revenue. And because the banks will not loan against the assets, the government will be the guarantor. The combined four entity debt is estimated is, is estimated to be between 120 and 180 billion dollars. Remember, the three waters model will only work if it can achieve that 45% efficiency target. If it only achieves 20%, we're going to all pay lots more than we do now. This makes privatisation very real. There is, n there is no council ownership, and it is embarrassing that the government uses the word ownership, as it falls way short of the legal definition, as Peter said. It, it, better off looking at it under Clayton ownership, if you can remember that, you of us here. If the model does not deliver, the government is weighed down with debt. Doesn't the, then the option of selling off 50% become quite attractive? And to provide reality to this, last year at the local government conference in Blenheim, the Prime Minister stated that privatisation would not happen under her watch. Now, well... 
who who is on watch after she is longer prime minister? Is that the midnight watch? As Peter said, New Zealand does have a problem with keeping its water infrastructure up to standard. And there's two reasons for that. Some councils have neglected investing in long-term three waters and have used the funds elsewhere for magnificent stadiums and nice things like that. I mean, you just can't have your cake and eat it. And then the other reason is that councils, some councils simply don't have the rating capacity to be able to fund investments that are required. I see there are three solutions, and the right one could be a combination of all three. Now, one, councils actually need auditing, proper auditing to ensure their long-term infrastructure plans are actually followed through with. Not just the audit we get that tells us off for buying too many staplers. Second one is the pooling and sharing of neighbouring council resources, but on a scale that would be no bigger than say, Otago or Southland. You can work with that. And the other third mechanism is by a shift to localism. Now, localism is where more tax money is allocated to local decision-making. And I'll just touch on localism because uh, it's very important. Now, localism involves shifting power and decision-making back to citizens and their communities. Well... The, the opposite of localism is obviously centralism. And New Zealand is the most centralised country in the OECD, with 88% of all collected taxes and public revenue being controlled and allocated by central government. Now, the average ratio in the OECD is 46%. Yeah. Is this three waters reform the next step in this government achieving total centralisation? Thanks. Thanks very much, Ludi. I'd, um, yeah, I'd like to suggest that we um, vote in on this meeting. <laughs> you, um, you might find you get the chance to stand for that later tonight. <laughs> uh, do we have anyone else uh, who would like to speak? We got, yep. Oh, oh we got Don. You might have to wait a sec, Don. We got till we once. Thanks very much, Logan, and uh, congratulations to the uh, Taxpayers' Union and to Groundswell for such a magnificent turnout. Uh, best in the country so far, Peter, by a mile. So, uh, well done, well done. Um, thank you. So, I, I'm Penny Simmons, uh, National MP for Invercargill, and I just want to reiterate the comments that were made before, that National if we are in government next year, will repeal and will replace the legislation. Uh, we do not agree. There's sort of, uh, there's a number of different options and uh, Rangi Ian has just, sorry, Ian has just outlined a number of them. So uh, we, we're working through policy now, but certainly centralisation is not the answer. We've seen that with the politics sector, we're going to see it with the health sector, and we will see it with this. And make no mistake about it, this government has an ideology that centralisation and more done by government in Wellington is better, and we are completely against more centralisation. Um, I've seen it in the politics sector, what a mess it's made of that. So we will repeal, we will replace, and there will be a range of options because it's not going to be one size fits all. There will be different options that suit different regions. There may be councils that want to work together. There will have to be some co-funding not co-governance, be very sure, not co-governance, but co-funding, and we need to be looking at 
ensuring that the decisions and the accountability as, is at a local level. So um, I know Bryce, this uh, groundswell is very adamant about not being political, but I'll tell you what, this country cannot afford to go without a change of government next year or, or there will be more and more of this centralisation. It's government ideology. Thank you. Thank you very much, Penny. We've also got Joseph here. <laughs> uh, cheers, Logan. Hey, uh, good day, everyone. I'm Joseph Vinnie. I'm the Member of Parliament for Southland. And um, I just wanted to just talk very briefly, just, just this year, I mean, protect local democracy. I mean, this is a key part of this. And, and my signature's there. I saw the team on, uh, on the weekend and uh, put my name to it. And look, it's, it's a really critical thing. New Zealand's one of the um, young bird countries in the world, uh, but it's one of the oldest democracies, uh, unbroken democracy for 129 years. So um, we, we've had a long history. Originally, people could only vote in this country if they uh, had freehold, or the freehold landowners. In 1867, uh, the government realised that there was a problem because Māori uh, owned land collectively, generally, and couldn't vote in elections. So um, Māori men were given the universal franchise ahead of all other uh, uh, people in the country um, in terms of they didn't have to own freehold land. In 1879, uh, all men were given the universal franchise, all adult males could vote in New Zealand elections. And in 1893, New Zealand became the first country in the world in which all adult men and women could vote. Um, so we, we've got a really proud history in this country of ensuring everyone has a voice and those who make the decisions that affect them. And this is what local democracy is. Uh, the National Party really believes in uh, devolution to uh, communities, uh, to them uh, making their decisions. Uh, that affect them, and what is more important than water? Uh, water is, one, is critical for life, critical for all of us, and uh, you need to be able to have a say in the uh, development of your community and the maintenance of the assets uh, that uh, affect your life and ensure that basically you have, you have something to drink. Um, and I just, I'll just touch very briefly on um, what we're talking about. So if we win the election next year, if, if no questions asked, we are repealing uh, the legislation that went for its first reading tonight uh, in the Parliament, so it went for its first reading tonight, we're going to repeal that within the first 100 days of our government, if we're elected next year. So if you, if you really care, I'd encourage you to get out and vote um, and support um, us. Uh, so, so sorry Bryce, you said don't get political, I can't, like, I, I, this, this, I mean, politics matters, and you know, your vote matters, it really, it really, really does. Um, and I'll just talk about re um, replace, because I, I hear people, well, hang on, what do you mean replace? Uh, so look, um, councils know their communities. And uh, if we win the election, we'll make sure that uh, control of those water assets go back to local government. Uh, what if we, um, that alternative legislation we, we'll look at, because there is a problem, some councils don't have, or they haven't adequately invested in their water infrastructure for you know, a century in some cases, so, so it's not up to scratch and it's going to take a lot of money to fix it. Um, so uh, there needs to be alternative legislation to provide a framework a pragmatic um, timeline and a suite of structures and governance models that councils can adopt, but it'll be up to them to work together. Uh, so we're about empowering local government. Um, local government has the ability to work together uh, where they want to, and actually it doesn't need a one-size-fits-all approach, a centralisation model, which this uh, Labor government uh, believes in. Um, our view is that if councils want to form, say, for, for example, a council control organisation, uh, then they have the ability to finance that through debt, for example, in terms of borrowing to fund some of that infrastructure. And we also look at models around what we've referred to as um, investing with them. So basically central government uh, contributing to the capital that uh, local government needs to build the infrastructure they need for the next 20, 30 years. Because uh, National believes we need to power up regional economies. Uh, to power up regional economies, you need good infrastructure. So we, we need to support our local democracy, our local councils. Thank you. I now see we've got uh, Don Boys here who's keen to say a couple of words. Thanks, Logan. Yeah, Don Boys from Southland District Council. Uh, won't, I'll just be brief, but um, I've been a wee bit disappointed, uh, like Ian, I think, with uh, the response from councils, say, from Omaru South not joining that um, group of councils that have stood up against this uh, re uh, reform. Um, Peter talked about the UN Declaration for Indigenous People. That talked about equality. 
the Treaty of Waitangi, Article 3, that talks about equality, that this reform is a structural uh, inequality by design. So for, for me, it was a pretty simple decision. decision. And the Local Government Act, I'm wondering how uh, some of our other councillors come to this, their decision. And the Local Government Act, just quickly, um, talks, or the purpose of local government, to enable democratic um, local decision making and uh, on behalf of communities and providing or, or uh, allowing for social and cultural um, well-being. So I'm not sure that this uh, inequality in such a major piece, piece of infrastructure is going to do that. And one other thing, the financial case, we've, we've heard a bit about that tonight, but um, the government was su has suggested that the, the, the key assumption behind their financial case is that these bureaucracies are going to generate 1% savings per year for 30 years. And that's how they've based their, um, their case as far as the finances of it goes. But there does need to be a conversation around how we use the water, how we relate to the water and use it in our daily lives. South and District has a lot of small towns and to build the infrastructure and manage the waste that comes from those is pretty expensive for a small group of people. So there does need to be a conversation around how that's done. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Tom. If we've got no one further, we'll move on. Have we got one down the back, waving his head? Oh, sorry. Any of them? We'll have to um, keep it short if we can, guys, because we need to keep moving on. Evening everybody, uh, my name is Sean Wilson, some of you will know me, some of you won't have heard of me. Uh, I'm a member of a new political party called the New Nation Party and um, I am just here to say that irrespective of who you're going to vote for at the next election, there's a word that's been used on the forums here tonight with regard to referendum and it's called binding. What that means is that you, the people, have control of your politicians, both local and on a national level. And I uh, really encourage you going into this next election to be looking at what politicians and political parties are offering you the option of binding referenda to control the politicians and your local elected representatives. If you don't have that control, you'll get promises coming into elections, and we know what happens to most of them, irrespective of the parties involved. So if you remember nothing else from what I've told you, just remember the word binding referendum and do a little research on it. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Rob. That was um, sort of weird. Um, was that a was that a politician that that didn't push his own boat and just told told us what to do for the best thing of the people? Um, hi everybody, I'm no one body. Basically, I'm not any one of one of these wonderful learned people up here. Um, except I would just like to talk to you from a point of view of communications because our current. Um, Prime Minister is a communications guru, she's great, but she's up to dodgy stuff. Okay, so I'd just like to say that she is weaponizing South Māori. So ao Māori, it means the Māori world. She is weaponizing it to drive more division in our country. Yeah. So I'm an individual that I describe myself as a mandate-injured teacher. 
I used to be a choir chorus with our Māori at a local school. I used to be a Māori teacher until I decided not to do something that meant the government said I couldn't go to work and I became a prim criminal if I set foot on my school. I'm not going to say the word because I'm so too busy talking about that. But what I want to say to you is that tikanga Māori just means Māori protocol. Ma ma, ma sorry, I'm getting nervous. I don't know what prepared speech. Ma tauranga Māori means Māori knowledge. And with greatest respect, Mosala, that um, to call the water a taonga actually isn't absurd. And I would just say that this is from a lack of understanding from yourself rather than disrespect. So please, I'm not trying to disrespect you in any way. Water is a taonga because it is, a, is a, an expression of the god Maru, who is one of the gods, the many gods that the Māori people have. And he is the god of fresh water. You may have heard of Tangaroa, he's the seawater fella. Maru is the freshwater guy. Thank you, Luke. You remember the things I taught you. <laughs> so, um, to not to talk of your water as anything other than Tonga is to disrespect the God. So, all I would like to ask is that everyone here tonight, please, do not get on the, the Māori are out to get everything bandwagon, which is what the government wants you to get on. They have... They have established a new witch hunt, sorry, group that are trying to look for extremists. They're already putting the kōrero or the narrative in the paper that racism is on the rise. It can't be true. And our beautiful, beautiful nation, please do not let that woman and her communications team get you onto a bandwagon that is just heading for more control of all of us. Thank you. Um, well, we need to move on. Oh, we had a Don, eh? That guy in the back, he came up. Sorted. <laughs> um, I've lost my train of thought there. So, uh, give me two seconds. So, in a minute, we're going to hear from uh, Nobby Clark. Um, but just before we do, we've got Louis from the Taxpayers Union who's going to say a couple of words. Three minutes, say, eh, Louis. Hey, we will be quick. Uh, I'm Louis from the Taxpayers Union. I've taken over from Jordan for the Invercargill to Wellington leg of the Stop Three Waters Roadshow. And the reason I'm here right now is to break some news, uh, but Joseph actually already broke the news, which is that today in Parliament at about 4.30, the Three Waters core legislation passed its first reading. And of course that was the Labour Party that used their majority. They can basically do what they want. But what happens when a bill passes, passes its first reading is it goes to Select Committee, in this case the Finance and Expenditure Select Committee, and that committee has to hear public submissions. And fortunately for us we have built an army of 100,000 New Zealanders who are ready to give the MPs on this committee help. So if you haven't already signed... If you haven't already signed the uh, official Stop Three Waters petition that we had outside and on our website, it seems like 99% of you have. Please do, because as soon as the public submissions open, we will be emailing every one of our 100,000 New Zealanders, encouraging them and giving them instructions on how to make a basic submission. And we've got a really simple message for the MPs on this committee that we'd like to see in every, in every submission. It's not, it's not good enough for you as an MP to barricade yourself in the, dusty roads, in the dusty rooms of Wellington hearing submissions over Zoom or in writing. You need to do what the Taxpayers Union is doing, what Brownsville is doing. Hit the road, hear the concerns of ratepayers and local leaders face to face in Fairley, in Gore, in Invercargill, in Pukekohe, in New Plymouth. To make this real, I want to address uh, the names of the MPs on the committee so you know who they are. It's Barbara Edmonds, Andrew Bailey, Ingrid Leary, Duncan Webb, Anna Lork, Greg O'Connor, Damian Smith, Chloe Swarbrick, come to Invercargill, Chloe. <laughs> Simon Watts, Helen White, and Nicola Willis, come down to Invercargill. Thank you. Thank 
Thanks very much for that, Louis. It's good to hear that you're on the job. G'day, I'm Nobby Clark. I'm Deputy Mayor of Invercargill City Council. Um, and I'm going to speak today about my opposition to uh, Three Waters and the reform that's been pushed through by the government. Um, and this is my personal view because our council is very much split down the middle on this issue. So I'm opposed to the um, reform on five levels. The first level was the uh, dishonesty of the minister and cabinet around how they dealt with this issue. So early on in the piece, they gave us two months and they said to us, we don't want you to consult with the community at this stage. We want you to give, it, give your concerns to us. We will respond. We will then give you some um, information that's specific to your area so that you can go out and talk to your community and at any stage you can opt out. What we subsequently found out is that prior to making that commitment to us, the Minister and Cabinet had already decided to mandate the issue and take away our rights to consult with our community and to opt out if we wanted to. The second area of concern for me is the he pua pua by stealth approach by this government. So for those interested, they should read that document. It's all about co-governance. And it's, um, um, it's important when it comes to Three Waters because while the issue of ownership is important, and the most important issue on this is not ownership, but on the control itself. So a very simple example of that is most people don't care who owns the bus that runs around and picks people up in a the city. They just want to know that it arrives on time and that the cost doesn't escalate. And when I've challenged uh, central government and the minister about why we have a 50-50 shareholder split in these new entities between iwi or mana whenua and the uh, general population via the councils, we get the answer that it's a treaty expectations. And I don't know where treaty expectations takes away the right of one person, one vote. Um, it gives rights to uh, mana whenua, but not that. It's gone too far. And I also don't understand as part of that why we have a South Island entity and yet Nelson, Tasman, Marlborough and the Chatham Islands are excluded because they are in opposition to Naitahi over some treaty claims and the design of this program should not be dictated by internal conflict within Iwi. The third reason why I'm uh, concerned about the ongoing issue is the issue of government control of our democracy and it, there's no secret that the government has an annual $55 million media fund uh, which it uses very carefully to couch conversations around sensitive issues like, like the ones that we're discussing today. And I think that um, it has the effect of uh, silencing or uh, gatekeeping the information via the mainstream um, media. What is also of concern to me is that the DIA have signed a heads of agreement with Local Government New Zealand. So Local Government New Zealand is the representative body, the lobby group for councils, we fund it. Um, and yet in that heads of agreement, unbeknown to us, was a non-criticism clause, which again is a, an issue to silence up the uh, impact of what's happening with uh, Three Waters. And the other final issue on, on that, before I get into some more specifics about the program itself, is the issue of fresh water versus drinking water. And you'll hear um, ministers and you'll hear um, government officials talking about the need to safeguard the health of human beings and to improve fresh water. Well, most people don't actually realise that about only 2% of what we treat um, in our stations that goes out to the general public is actually drunk. The other 98% is used for stock feed, it's used for washing machines, it's used for uh, dishwashers, it's used to flush toilets and so on. Um, so we're taking a sledgehammer to what could be a potentially a much smaller problem. And so hence I think uh, there needs to be a review. But the other area for me is that drilling down from all of that is, is the what is the program built on? So the program is built on basically three planks, and I'll go through each three of them because it's important that you know about those. The three planks are economy of scale, that if we do it in a large organisation, there be, can be some, some savings there. The second plank is the ability to recruit and retain water engineers. And the third one is to upscale the amount of investment that's not been going into these infrastructures that needs to be there for the future. So going back to the economy of scale, um, the program is built on overseas exp experience and suggests that there could be a 45% um, improvement in the costings across the board. Um, and some of the figures that the uh, Internal Affairs Department have, have put out are eye-watering and it scares people into thinking, well, we need this economy of scale. The independent advice that our city council has got and others have as well suggests that that 45% will be closer to 25%. And that undermines the ability of the program to actually deliver 
the, uh, the cost benefits they say they will. The second issue is the ability to recruit and retain water engineers. These people are desperately needed. We have shortages in our council, and most councils do have vacancies in this area. There is a national and international shortage of qualified water engineers. And when I put that to um, um, the internal affairs management, how would they be able to deliver the program with a shortage? Their response was, well, we're talking to the universities about encouraging more people to do the degree course. But of course, the degree course takes three years. And they said, oh, but we'll be able to uh, retain your uh, water engineers from council when we transfer in 2024. And of course, that's a, fall a fallacy as well, because one, some of these engineers will not want to transfer to Christchurch or Dunedin, away from places like Invercargill and other areas. Two, some of them may very well retire. And three, the other big impact that they haven't factored in is that the uh, water contractors, the three water contractors, who are the likes of Downers and others, as they upscale to do this increased work, they will want um, water engineers as well. And they'll want them spread all over the South Island. So they'll be quite happily tapping on the shoulders of our staff saying, do you want to join the ranks? Um, and the chances are the private sector will pay better pay rates anyway. And the final issue, which is the major concern, is the ability for the existing three water contractors, which are the independent companies who do the work for us now, to upscale. And the DIA say they need an upscale of about 200%. Um, and a, and a, a survey about a year ago of the major players within that field in New Zealand said they could only upscale about 20%. So I put that to the Internal Affairs Department of staff and said, so how are you going to uh, get over that shortfall? And Because that shortfall creates two areas. Uh, one, you won't be able to deliver. And the response to that is, we may need to recruit some international players to come into the market in New Zealand. To me, that isn't good for New Zealand. Um, we want um, our work to be done here by New Zealand providers that uh, if they make a profit, which they all do, the profits will stay in New Zealand. Um, so that, that was one issue. And, and the other issue was, if you have a shortage of uh, uh, contractors to do the work, will they tender, because a lot of this work will be tendered annually, for the big metro? So will a company do uh, Christchurch and, and Selwyn and other areas, and will the small rural areas out in the Mackenzie country and around Southern District lose out because people will not want to transfer staff across long distances or will not want to put depots in small towns? And their response to that is, oh, we'll try and contract them um, and to do that work. But logic would tell you they won't. If they've only got a capacity to do 10 jobs a week and there's, there's 50 up for, or 40 up for grabs, they'll, they'll, they'll cherry pick where they want to do it. So that undermines um, their ability to do that. So I often get asked quite a few questions about um, you know, where to from here, and I'll, I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. But I guess this, um, from a government perspective, there are some bits of information that they are aware of that they don't tell us about. And I've prompted them many times to be upfront and honest um, with the community about this, but they don't want to talk about it. So the most contentious issue is this program, this reform, is built on what they call user pay. So user pay basically means um, houses will have water meters. Now, water meters are very controversial. And the, the research in New Zealand shows that when you look at places that do have it, and the, our local example is Central Otago, um, but they've had them in, in water care in Auckland, which is massive, and in Kuipera and uh, Whangarei and places like that as well. The ones that have had it, there's been opposition for them to come in because what it says is you will pay for what you use. It's a little bit like a, a, a power meter. And so uh, what that over, over time does is it um, keeps the cost down. If you want to be careful on, on how long you have a share and how many times you use a washing machine a week, you can save some money. If you don't, then you'll pay dearly. And so um, I've asked them, how much does it cost to put a water meter into a house? And if we know how many houses we've got in our geographical area, we can work out what the cost of that is and why don't you have that into your forecast going forward. And they won't provide that, but I know what it is. And it's not huge, um, And but the, the research now clearly shows if you look at water care in Auckland, which is connected up to about 1.6 million of our population, Auckland residents per capita use about 25% of the water annually that uh, citizens in the South Island use. And the logic of that is, because you're paying for it, you have to be careful. If you're not paying for it, away you go. Now the downside for us on that is, we've had a serious drought in Southland recently. And that drought has impacted, and we've come very close to uh, turning off taps and things in recent times. Um, so the water meters are contentious, 
but the government won't go. They, they say they're leaving it up to the water entities to put that in, and that's not good enough. Uh, they need to be upfront about that. The other large cost that they're not um, disguising to us is the conversion of wa water waste into land. So at the moment, 89% of the discharge treatment plants in New Zealand discharge to a river that leads to the sea or to the sea. Now, there's been a big push by government to make sure that all discharge goes to land. Um, and certainly Naitahu locally have said they will challenge any renewed consents that are going to water again. So we have significant costs. And in some areas, some of the more rural areas, there are lots and lots and lots of small treatment plants spread all over the place. Each and every one of those is going to have to be discharged to land, and that is not an easy or cheap exercise. But the government won't factor that in and tell us what it's, what it's all about. So I, th I guess there's um, two big costs in there that they keep out of the equation because they know they're contentious, and that's not good enough going forward. I often get some frequently asked questions, and, 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 and I'll, I'll just cluster them into two things, and they say, well, surely there must be some good in, in this reform, and there are some things that are not so good. So I'll do the easy one first, which is what are the good things. Well, the good things are that the um, um, regulations or the act that's coming through will improve the quality of the water that we drink. The downside of that is it'll affect all the fresh water, which is the other 98% which isn't logical because there will be a significant cost to that. And the other good thing is that there is a monitoring water agency set up under the Act as well, and it will monitor each region. Now, the benefit of that is that previously it was monitored by the Ministry of Health, and that was an absolute disaster. Um, and so um, that is a positive thing. And um, so that's where I would stop the reform and say we need to put the quality standards in. We need to put in an agency that monitors local government at the moment but before we take a sledgehammer to the local government, we need to step back a little bit um, and rethink how we deliver drinking water safety as opposed to fresh water safety. And so what's not good about um, the reform? Well, the DIA and the local government New Zealand having heads of agreement that doesn't allow our lobby group to um, criticise the government has now forced about 40% of the councils into a separate democracy group and that's been very contentious. The government runs that down by saying it's not the majority, but you must be mindful that Invercargill didn't join that group, but nearly half our councillors, uh, nearly half our councillors are opposed to Three Waters and are opposed to um, the current representation we get from local government New Zealand. So while you might only have 32 or 33 councils out of 67 in the separate group, you still have an awful lot of uneasy elected members that are sitting in the groups that still remain. The other issues that are, are, are not helpful is that the government's recently set up a panel which was independently chaired but it had representation from council and the DIA on it to look at the concerns that were ongoing. So the government was trying to listen to the concerns but the most contentious concern is the co-governance issue around how iwi across the country or mana whanua which is the local tribes across the country will have a 50% stakeholding in these water entities where in the South Island, Naitahu probably represents only about 5% of the population. And so that's been very contentious. And when I asked the chair, yes, it's very nice that you've got 42 recommendations, which the government's likely to uh, adopt most of them. Why didn't you uh, address the issue of co-governance, which is one of the primary issues that's sitting around the ownership issue? And his response was, uh, we, did, we know that uh, that's an issue. We know how contentious it is, but we didn't put that to government because we know that caucus has already got that as one of their uh, central platforms, the whole issue of co-governance, which some people is the he pua pua report being implemented. And I thought that was a, a sad indictment that we weren't prepared as a collective group to put that up. The other issue is the issue of investment. So as you go forward in Three Waters, there will be need to invest money to upscale. And um, the issue for that is who will be in the priority? Well, from where I sit, there will be two priorities and any any uh, group of citizens that are outside these two clusters will be low down on the priority for investment. The primary investment, from my assessment, will be those areas in the South Island that have huge growth. So they're Queenstown, Wanaka, and Selwyn, which is south of Christchurch, which has had massive growth. You can't not have uh, three water in, uh, infrastructure in those areas. But the other area that will get some attendance through co governance will be the um, small Maori intensive communities out in the rural areas that are, are going to have quite a significant voice. And the rest of us, I think, will be further down the track. So how does that impact from my local council? Well, 
we've got a very good water supply um, through a large river, but we don't have an alternative, and we're one of the few councils that doesn't have an alternative supply. So if that structure that pulls the water out at Brank's home was in any way damaged, we would have about two or three days supply in the city. So we, we need the investment as well. And the final thing that really grates me is that the Prime Minister announced in, in Blenheim uh, late last year at a local government New Zealand conference that the um, government slash water entities were going to put $2 billion across the 67 councils as what they called a no worse off payments. So we were going to get some money to soften what we saw as the loss of our uh, infrastructures, which is good to borrow against. So the government's share of that is 500 million, it's a quarter, and they've already put that up front right now because they're, they're trying to keep the councils on side. But the other side of it is the 1.5 billion that's being raised by the water entities. Now you don't have to be a rocket scientist to work out that water entities on day one have no cash. When they get the assets across, which is the ownership, they will go and borrow. So they'll go and borrow 1.5 million in the first, one, sorry 1.5 billion in the first year, proportionally give it out to the uh, 21 councils in the South Island. But you've got to ask, who pays for that? Well, of course, ratepayers pay for it because that's the only source of income that the water entities have. So they will borrow against the assets that we already own and are being transferred, give it to us. There'll be interest on that borrowing, which means that we will, as our rates go up over the next six or seven or eight, nine years, we will pay back the money they're giving us. Well, that doesn't seem like a very good deal to me. In fact, I think it's just absolutely dumb. And so the, um, that's the, the final area that I think is not right. And um, as a final reflection, I think we need to stop what we're doing and rethink through the implementation beyond the monitoring. And the other thing that we need to think about is, is, is that some councils can stand alone, like the professional advice that we got from consultants and experts and we got two sets of it, and one set internally as well, said that Invercargill City, because of its good track record in investing in infrastructure, could actually stand alone. We don't need to cross-subsidise other areas because the downside of all of this is that some councils have done extremely well, and those will get very little investment in the short to medium term, and they will subsidise the other areas that haven't done well. They've used their ratepayer money and diverted off for new museums or new stadiums or whatever. And so that's uh, a dilemma for those that have done well. Um, and so we need to be really mindful of that. So uh, we need to stop to it. And the only way to do that is to keep lobbying. That was um, a yeah, pretty good presentation. Um, I hope you all, all enjoyed Nobby's presentation as much as I did. Um, yeah, it's just good to see the practicality he brings in on the common sense solutions that he talks about. Um, yeah, hopefully, hopefully we can uh, solve a few of these problems in our communities. Um, now I've probably mucked up before. Um, in the in the balance in the interest in the interest of a balanced presentation, are there any? Because um, we gave the two national MPs here um, a bit of um, a bit of air time. Are there any Labor MPs who would like to say a couple of words? <laughs> That's been pretty full on. Um, would any of you like to hear a joke? Um, no, I cannot. I, I know that he got an invitation. Um, I don't know. Have, um, Bryce, have we heard? I don't think. He did say that he wouldn't be No, he did reply and say he wouldn't be attending. We've just heard that he's at the Ascot Park uh, at the at the Balance and Environment Awards. Um, right, so we've got a joke. Um, as we've been getting around in our first four meetings, we've um, we've run into quite a few mayors down this way who seem to they like to talk about being in the tent and and talking to people inside the tent and um, and they think they they're doing really well. Um, one of our groundswell guys yesterday came up with a joke and I thought it was pretty good and I thought you'd probably enjoy it. Where are we? <laughs> after a hard day in an LG, 
Our GNZ conference, three southern mares walk into a bar on Langton Quay. The barman Julie asks, what would you three fellas like to drink? The mayor, the mayor on the left looks across at the other two mares and replies, we'll take three waters, thanks. <laughs> There was um, Duncan, one of our ground so guys that made that up. I thought he'd done pretty well. <laughs> um, so usually now uh, Scotty Bright, our ground coordinator from Port Kikaui, has been with us. And he um, he spoke and I just thought a few of you might find a couple of his points um, interesting because these um, these guys in Port Kikaui are right into their horticulture. Um, so Scotty was talking about onion producers. Um, these guys... Yeah, the, the cost of production on onions are about $450 a tonne. Um, at the moment, they're selling these onions for $500 a tonne. So they get a $50, $50 a tonne margin. What do you reckon the supermarket's selling for? $1,500 a tonne. Cabbages. Um, Scotty talked about cabbages. Now, there's, there's heap tiers of cabbages in Pukekohe at the moment getting... They can't get them to sale because of the labour shortages, um, so they are rotary hoeing them back into the dirt. Um, I imagine that as a farmer to see your produce, it's either going to rot on the ground or you rotary hoe back in. Um, seems quite ironic to me that under a labour-led government, we can't even get labour to get our food to market. <laughs> we'll uh, move on to LGNZ. Um, is there anyone in the room that is aware of, of what our GNZ is and what they do? Yep, that was me six weeks ago too. I didn't have a clue who they were. Um, so our GNZ are, are a conduit between central government and local government. So for the farmers in the room, we'd compare them to beef and lamb, dairy and Z. Um, now, they state on their website that their job is to advocate for local communities and push those community messages back to central government. Sounds quite nice, doesn't it? So, we at Groundswell were quite disillusioned when we run into a heads of agreement, as we've heard about from uh, Nobby, heads of agreement between our GNZ and the Crown. Um, so, if you we uh, start on the left there and run down and we ask ourselves, who is the minister? Pardon? I don't remember. Um, we ask ourselves, who is the minister for local, of local government? Um, that's Nanai Mahuta. If we come down the right hand side and uh, we ask ourselves, who leads up the Three Waters reform, reforms on behalf of the Crown? Nanai Mahuta. We can't decide if this is a heads of agreement or a conflict of interest. Um, but just in case you don't believe me and you think I might be making it up, usually I can see this. Oh, I can see it on my computer. We thought we'd better bring a bit of actual information off the heads of agreement for you so that you know that we're, we're not making it up. This is actually true. So clause 4.3c, if after the end of the period referred to in clause 3.2b, so we better understand that, clause 3.2b, that local authorities will be provided in a reasonable period, expected to be around eight weeks and commencing immediately after the LGNZ 2021 conference, to consider the impact of the reforms, including the financial support package. Now, do you all remember the financial support package? It's sort of real similar to the um, funding that our media can apply for. It's not a bribe. So they have to consider that on them and their communities and an opportunity to provide feedback. So if after the end of that period, referred to in that clause, the government decides to adopt an all-in legislated approach to the Three Waters Reform, then our GNZ, who's been put there to advocate on behalf of you guys, agrees that it will accept such a decision on the basis that our GNZ will not actively oppose such an approach. I should be seeing a whole lot of bullshit songs. <laughs> so Timaru District Council have already done this. They, well, yeah, this, so this is why we are asking you guys to, um, 
to sign those um, to sign the letters to council to to discontinue the funding of our GNZ. Um, you guys, New Zealand ratepayers, fund our GNZ to the tune of four million dollars a year, and we believe that this money could be spent, you know, in far better places than to guys that are going to sign away their rights to advocate for us. Timaru District Council have already done this. Um, if Nigel Bowen, if Nigel Bowen, the Mayor of Timaru District Council, was not in the High Court in Auckland this week, he would have been here to present to you because he's pretty passionate about, about what can be done here. Um, so we need to remember, we'll, we'll move on from poor old LGNZ. Um, you just need to remember that someone said to me the other day, bad things happen when, when good people do nothing. And I see a whole lot of good people in this room. So something you can do, I have been running people through this um, in, in the meetings, but it takes a bit long, so we're not going to do it tonight. But what you can do is tonight when you get home, if there's one thing you do before you go to bed, jump on your phone, search dub dub dub, it's your water dot nz, and you can go on there and you can send a letter to your council. Um, and let them know your concerns. It, it's easy, it takes about three minutes. My five-year-old can do it. It's, um, it's not hard at all. Um, yeah, you just flick through, through, flick through a few things and um, should be good. Right, we're gonna move on now to, um, have any of you guys heard of Chris Romero? Yeah. Yeah. We've been training this guy up all week. Um, at the start, he was pretty rusty, and he's, he's sort of getting better as he goes. But I reckon in this hometown tonight, he's going to nail this. Um, we found him on a building site down in Invercargill, but I reckon there could be bigger things coming for this guy. Ladies and gentlemen, Chris Romero. Thank you very much. Now, there's a lot of people that are in the room tonight. It doesn't actually look very many when you're sitting up the front looking forwards. But from up here looking back, what a turnout. So what I've got to say is give yourselves a good round of applause for getting out and for getting vocal. You know, uh, as we've travelled around the south of Otago presenting this message, we've been, this is our fifth uh, our fifth event now, this is the biggest one, but we should expect that to be so because it's the biggest centre that we've been in. But one of the things that we've seen is that the people of this area are awake and the people of this area are not particularly happy with the things that our government is doing and that, that the people of this area are actually prepared to get off the couch and do something about it. And so that's something that we should all be encouraged about. You're not nuts if you think that what the government is doing is outrageous. You are not nuts. Apparently, that is the opinion of the majority of us as Kiwis. And so uh, as we've, as we've travelled about and, and what have you and we've seen and talked to different people, one of the things that has been amazing to me is the fact that the, the, the people by and large, almost with one accord that I've met, I haven't seen, nobody's come to the meeting other than if the odd mayor and the odd councillor as a heckler. Everybody else in the meeting is, is, is by and large in one accord and I don't know how many people are in the room here tonight, but we've, would there be six, seven, eight hundred people in here perhaps? We've, we've seen what, over 2,000 people so far on our travel around the place. Apparently, Otago and Southland are not accepting the garbage that are coming out from central government. So give yourselves a good pat on the back. You deserve it. So just as I begin, what I'm here tonight to, to present to you on is a, is a, a group called Refreshing Local Democracy and, and how that can have uh, an impact on our local community here in Invercargill. But just as we begin, I just want to state a plain and obvious fact that no doubt everyone in this room will agree on, and yet we live in a day and in an age when we have to state these things because it doesn't seem to be the status quo anymore. And that is to say that we the people are supposed to be the ones whose opinions will be considered by those making decisions, whether it be at a local level or whether it be at a national level. Not big business interests, not international lobbyists, not the United Nations, not anyone else. It is the will of the people which ought to be supreme. And it would do many of our councillors and many of our elected representatives in the House of Representatives in Wellington a good lesson if they were to remember that. Because that is what democracy means. 
Our elected officials, both at a national and at a local level, should take a serious interest in what we the people want. But it seems to me oftentimes, maybe it seems to you as well, that often the opinions of their constituents are not at all on their priority list, and so we are consistently ignored and are treated as a mere inconvenience to their establishing of their idealistic dreams. Is it only me who sees it that way? And it's a disgrace, isn't it? It's an absolute disgrace. You know, these three waters reforms are just another classic example of politicians running roughshod over democracy, ignoring the will of the people, and outright lying to us in the process as they tell us how good these reforms will be for us. But seriously, is anyone really buying that narrative anymore? Is anyone really under any illusions that these water reforms are even intended to be for our good? Do you honestly believe that this government, which is attempting to, 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 to push this thing on us by force, is doing so because they genuinely believe that it's for the good of the people? Or are, are they doing it because this, it's pushing an ideological bent of co-governance for them and a massive asset grab away from the people towards centralisation? Which one do you think it is? Because I certainly don't think it's about fixing rusty old water pipes. You know, you have legislation being rammed through in Wellington against the will of the majority of Kiwis, and then you have local level councils being forced and strong-armed into participating with the government's undemocratic decrees. You know, I believe that it is time for we, the people, to say enough is enough. Do we agree? Our political system needs corrected, and there is no one who can do it for you other than we the people. That is where the power lies. That is where the answer is. The solution will always be with we the people. And perhaps you might think, maybe if I vote a little harder in the next election, my woes will be over. But I would suggest to you, the solution is beyond that. The solution is we the people must get involved again. We the people must hold these people to account. We must demand accountability from them. We must not continue to allow the disgrace that has been government, not just the, over the last three or six or nine years, but over the last several decades, where they have, they have consistently ignored the will of the people and have consistently gone against the clear majority. And so we've had the uh, NZ Taxpayers Union here tonight as well with us, and they actually did some polling uh, earlier in the year, which is quite telling, around the issue of whether or not Kiwis support the implementation of a centralised uh, structure for, for the Three Waters. In other words, that didn't quite use the term the Three Waters legislation that's being used here, but would you otherwise support the notion of these Three Waters reforms? Well, interestingly, three quarters of the New Zealanders who were surveyed came back saying, no, absolutely not, do not support. Eight percent of the New Zealanders surveyed said, yes, I do support, and the remaining 15 were unsure. What I would say to you is when you know that you have 8% support from the people, you have no mandate to continue. And it is no longer a democracy when a government continues down that path anymore. It is time for we the people to say enough is enough. Are you with me? And so whether or not that is the Labour Party uh, that, that we're wanting to bash on, because that's who we've been beaten up on tonight, or whether or not it's the National Party, as perhaps some of our colleagues here in front of us, it's not only the Labour Party who have behaved in this way, it's also our local councils. It's every party in politics have had their turn. It seems to me, and let me ask you whether or not you feel the same way, that sometimes when we elect these people to stand for us as our representatives, right, and they move away, whether it be to Wellington or whether it be uh, just down the road in Invocation, Chicago here, or maybe on 4th Street or on, is it Esk or Don, right, and they go down there to represent us as our councillors or as our local representatives, they seem to forget very quickly what it means to represent, don't they? Because a representative of the people must firstly represent the people, and it's that simple. What is the job description for a representative of the, of the people? Do what we want you to do. You must represent the people. You have no other job. 
There is nothing else for you to do other than to represent we the people. And so what I would say to any local councillor or mayor or, for that matter, a uh, representative in Wellington, either do your job or get lost and we'll get someone else who will. Is that rude? I hope so, you know, because it's about time. And so tonight I'm here not just to beat up on uh, elected representatives, but I'm also here to speak to you about this group called Refreshing Local Democracy. Right? Now the idea behind this group is to see, the, and the intention is to see local Kiwis equipped and enabled to stand for office in their local communities and to effect positive change because we believe that local councils should be answerable to the local population. It's outrageous, isn't it? Local councils answerable to the local population, not answerable to bureaucrats from Wellington, not answerable to population centres in Auckland, but answerable to their own people. In other words, the people sitting here right now in this room. And that's why we think that the best people for the job of councillors and the like will always come from within the local communities themselves. We don't want to tell you how to run your council or how to run your community, we simply want to equip you of some of what you will need in order to run a successful election campaign and ultimately, hopefully, get into office. And I think the most powerful and effective thing that any community can do is to band together and to select the best people in their area who they genuinely believe would make the best representatives for them. <laughs> And so when we band together and select those best people who can make a best representatives for us and then vote together as a block, that is democracy in action. But do you know what the last turnout was to the last uh, local body elections here in Invercargill? How many people turned out to vote of total eligible voters? It was just under 40%. You're right. It's not hard to win an election, apparently, when no one comes out to vote. What I would suggest to you is if you took those names away tonight of the councillors who, who did vote uh, uh, according to a manner that you might be happy, that would then tell you probably some of the councillors who didn't. And apparently the mayor didn't either because the numbers were... Um, <laughs> well, maybe I should ask before I say. But, but apparently you could, you could determine from there which of those councillors are representing you, the people, on the matter of three waters and which of them aren't. And any councillor who's not should be given the, the hike outside. Does that make sense? Furthermore, we should be looking to vote in only those, as has been said, uh, those candidates from within our own number who would therefore ultimately stand up and represent us as the people. Anyone who otherwise uh, had any intentions to do, to do differently is not fit for office. You know, there's a, uh, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a bit of a, a, a humorous take you could take on this. You know, w to be a politician, there is no room for selfish ambition. It takes a while to sink in, doesn't it? But do you know what? To be a, 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 to be a representative of the people, there is no room for selfish ambition. You can be a politician and you can be corrupt and lie through your teeth, and that's unfortunately what I've come to expect. But if you want to truly be a representative of the people, you're not there for yourself. You're there for the people. Amen. What refreshing local democracy can offer you specifically is the training and assistance right, to, to attempt to make that happen. And so there's a training program spread out over four evenings via video call whereby different aspects and elements of a campaign and also what it means being in office are discussed and taught. You don't need to commit to doing all four evenings within the same week because it's repeated every week for six weeks. In other words, six weeks we're running the same four uh, four programs, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and you pick the four evenings that can work for you. You could do them all in, in, the same, in, in, a, in an order, or you could do them in whatever order you like. You can spread them out over the course of that six weeks, or you could do them multiple times if you wish. We are suggesting that not only would there be people interested in standing for council who might do that, but other people who would like to assist and support people to stand for council, uh, they could also go through that program. Ideally, the idea would be that you would get in together within our local community and within our local area with like-minded people
people all wanting to run for council together to, uh, to seek to affect the same change as each other and you would pool your resources and support one another to get in. What does it really matter if, if we had 10 or 15 people who, who were of the same mind and worked together to try and win seats in the city council? It's not for selfish ambition. If it's for the will of the people, what does it matter if 10 of you get in and 5 of you don't? It makes no difference. What's important is that you have representation. And so who really cares which people that is? And I think that's something that we can all agree on. And so we have some paperwork at the back uh, with regards to the Refreshing Local Democracy program that would encourage you to come up and see us after the fact. Uh, right down the back by the door there, there'll be people hanging around down there. We only have so much, so you might have to be in quick if you want some. We weren't anticipating thousands of people. But, uh, but what I would encourage you to do is whether or not it's through that program or whether or not it's through another, I would encourage you to get involved in local democracy, get involved in your local uh, body elections or whatever that should look like to see how you can affect positive of change from within your people because I believe that it's always local action that produces national impact. Do you see that? When local people get active and when local people get involved, that is what produces national impact. How many people here in the room tonight were encouraged to hear that the Timaru District Council have now withdrawn from LGNZ? And probably not too many of us are Timaru ratepayers, right? Yet, we are encouraged because we can see there's been a victory there in Timaru. Perhaps we can have the same victory here in Invercargill, but only when, or in Southland, right, but only when we, the people, get active and when we, the people, get involved. And so I would say to you, the challenge is set. What will you do? How will we then get involved with our local communities this year and the, and the upcoming elections, and what can we do uh, to be support? Thank you very much. Chris does about another five, he'll be getting pretty good, what do you reckon? <laughs> Righto. Okay, Bryce would like me to mention that uh, Joseph and Penny had to run off to the uh, Environment Awards, so that's why they happened. It's not that they don't want to talk to you. <laughs> we'll move on to, um, there's, hopefully there's a lot of you um, sitting in the crowd here thinking, what can I do to help? Because there's no way that Groundswell and, and the Taxpayers Union guys and Refreshing Local Democracy can do this by ourselves. Um, we need all of you to help us achieve this. And from the turnout that we're getting, we, we have a really good chance to um, turn this thing around and actually give our, give our community a, a pretty positive um, future. Um, so what we we need you to do is um, sign the letters um, that I read out before. I did read them out, eh? They've been circulating around. Um, please make sure we get your signatures on them um, and, and show your support. So next Thursday, 1pm, we're going to be at the Invercargill City Council offices. We'll probably be there a bit early, but, um, but your job that you can go away from here and do is bring four or five more people with you to that so that we can grab their signatures before we present it. So I'll, I'll take from that that applause that you're all agreeing that we're, we're going to do that. We're going to bring four or five people along and, and instead of having 600 people signing that, um, six fours, 24, two and a half thousand people. We'll do it. Peace, please. So that will spread the word, spread the word around and um, yeah, make sure we bring plenty of people along. But you can also volunteer to participate in the RLD program, Refreshing Local Democracy. Have we got anyone here tonight that, now by standing up now and, and saying to your community that you're going to go through the RLD program does not mean that you are standing for council. It means you're going to go through this course and see what it takes and see if you're keen to do it. And there's been a lot of people even say they will go through it so that they can support someone else. Is there anyone here that would be keen to do that? Here we go, guys. We've got... <laughs> How many have we got? I, there was more hands than we've seen anyway. 
This is awesome, Chris. You're going to be flat out, mate. Righto. Um, what about, I reckon we had probably 10 or 15 hands there. So we've um, we've heard from Ian down here, and we've heard um, how how the vote went as far as joining communities for local democracy. We only need a few more people to support those guys that are in there that are already standing up for their community. This is more than achievable, guys. Um, so I really believe that we can do this. Um, get behind us and um, support it. So, um, oh, here we go. And if, if you don't, if you're not one of the people that are are willing or, or have the time or, or are able to do that, um, you can support these candidates who have completed the ROD program. So, on the uh, yeah, if you see a, a candidate standing for to be elected for council and you know they've gone through the ROD program, they know that you know you know you know that they're going to stand up and do the best by you, their community. Um, yeah, we've got a real chance to make change. But remember what you're going to do before you go to bed. You're going to log on to www.itsyourwater.nz, send that message to your council and let them know what you think. You can press them. We've got it sorted so you can just send it, but if you want to get in there and give them a real stir up, feel free, put a bit of, a bit of bullshit in there. Um, so yeah, tonight send that. Next Thursday, I want to see you all outside the ICC City Council offices because after we do that, we're going to head round to the South and District Council offices and we're going to present theirs to them. Um, if anyone in the room is keen, I'm leaving Gore on Monday morning at 9pm in my tractor and I'm driving to Alexandra to present ones there and then I'm driving, then I'm driving to the Queenstown Lakes District Council offices and we're going to deliver them there. Then we're going to Gore on Wednesday and then I'll be down here. So if anyone wants to join me on that, um, come along, but otherwise I'll just go it alone and um, have, a, have a wee trip there, but I'm a big fella and I'll, I'll handle it. Um, and we, we have informed the police that we're going to be doing something in Gore, but that we haven't talked to the rest yet, have we, Bryce? But, um, and Bryce... Bryce and her crew are going to see the Clutha District Council on Monday and then yeah, we got word there was a few government officials coming to talk to them so they're going to get a surprise when they turn up. And then, um, yeah, we'll be back there on Wednesday, maybe back there on Wednesday to present these again. So um, we're going to get active. We're going to, yeah, I, I think we've heard this before from someone in Wellington. We're going to do this. Let's do this. Thank you. Um, Safe travels. Have a um, have a good night. I hope you've enjoyed our uh, presentation. And um, yeah, stay strong.